Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a wonderful day. Just excited uh, that you've decided to come and worship here with us. Uh, well, this week, I, God randomly re- reminded me, this week, God reminded me of one of the stupidest moments of my life. And I think this is a safe place to share. You won't share it anywhere else. It's just between me and a few thousand of you. No big deal. But uh, back in college, uh, I was hanging out with a friend one night. And a group of his friends came over. To be clear, I was not alone. I was with a group of people. They made me do it, okay, before I even share. uh, So we're with this group of friends, and we're walking around town when one of them said, I think we should go somewhere. I was like, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, Another guy said, I think we should go to the zoo. I'm like, okay, the zoo, that sounds like a great place. I love the zoo. Uh, The only problem is it's midnight and most zoos close before midnight. So we walk to the zoo, uh, we get to the zoo, it is closed, so we go to the side of the zoo, we come up to the fence, Uh, one of the guys throws his coat over the barbed wire on the fence, like folks, just to give you a picture, it's razor wire. It's like we're trying to break into a prison, okay? Not many people try to break into the prison, that's what we're doing, and uh, one by one, we helped each other climb over Uh, the fence. Just an important thing to note if you're concerned. I was a little concerned this week as well. Uh, One of our campus pastors looked it up. The statute of limitations on trespassing is six years, and it's been 16 years, so we are just fine. Set those worries (laughs) aside. So we're climbing over this fence, and nobody said a word. Uh, We were just climbing over, doing our thing, and as I was straddling the barbed wire at the top, like the razor wires between my legs, I like to say the Holy Spirit kind of enlightened me. And for the very first time, I began to think, maybe this isn't a very good idea. (laughs) Like, breaking into the zoo. I've never heard of someone break into a zoo before. Maybe this is a bad idea. And also, an important thing, we have no idea of what is in the cage that we're lowering ourselves into. So I'm sitting there straddling the barbed wire, and I'm like, is there a cheetah in this? I've heard cheetahs are fairly fast. How about a rhino, gorilla? They're kind of, you know, strong, an anteater with its snout. Like, do I grab its snout? I'm praying that it's a koala bear. I'm like, koala bears are so cute, and they sleep 23 out of 24 hours a day. He will be sleeping. And so I have, we have no idea. I'm not kidding. No idea what's in the cage. And I'll never forget, I was the person who discovered what was in it. We're walking in the dark trying to find out what's in this cage when all of a sudden I come face to face with an emu. And I've never been so glad to see an emu. I'm like, just come and hug. Let me hug you. Again, uh, just so you know, uh, breaking into a zoo is a lot of fun if you end up with the emus, but not if you end up with the tigers, okay? Uh, to, be, to be clear, though, again, just to say it again, I was not alone. Instead, I was a group of, with a group of people, and they made me do it, okay? Uh, well, right now, we're in a series called This Is My Year. This is my year. And as we step into this brand new year, we're talking about how can this new year be different? Like at the end of this year, how can we be at a different place? And for each of the four weeks of this series, we're talking about four simple things that we can live out in this new year. Four simple things that we can put into practice that can and are able to truly change the year before us. Now, as we just heard, the influence of other people is not always a good thing. Sometimes you can end up in a zoo after midnight. It's not always a, it's not always a good thing, but the truth is... One of the things that God tells us over and over again is the simple truth, don't do it alone. Translation, we need other people in our lives. We need other people around us. Yes, sometimes it can be a bad thing, but more often than not, it's a good thing. We need other people in our lives. Don't do it alone. Like at the start of the Bible, God creates a human being. And what's the, one of the very first things that God says? It is not good for you to be alone. And throughout the first part of the the Bible, the Old Testament is what we call it, we see close friendships. There's Moses and Aaron, Ruth and Naomi, David and Jonathan, Solomon, one of the wisest people to ever live, once said, it is better, two people are just better than one. Again, don't do it alone. And then there's Jesus, and he walks around not by himself, even though he's fully God, it's not by himself. Instead, he has 12 disciples with him. Again, don't do it alone. And one time, Jesus sends out a group of his followers to spread the news about this new kingdom, about God coming to earth. And how does he send them out? There's 72 followers to be exact. How does he send them out? He sends them out 
two by two. One more time and something for all of us. One simple thing that we can live out that can change this new year. Every single part of it is this. Do not do it alone. Again, in 2019, you need other people in your life. You need other people around you. Don't do it alone. So yes, don't do it alone, right? But one thing that matters so much is who we surround ourselves with. It's like, yes, we need people, but when it comes to those who are closest to us in our lives, we need the right people. Not just a human being, not just people in in general, but instead we need the right people around us. And so today, today we're just gonna, gonna highlight some specific things that we should look for when it comes to the people that we have in our lives. And to do so, we're gonna look at two different sets of verses about a guy named Paul. And Paul, he shows up in the New Testament. He actually has the name Saul. Then God changes him, and he also changes his name as well to Paul. Paul used to kill Christians. Now he's signing up people to become one. Paul, he also just gives us this perfect picture, this great picture of the people that we need in our lives. And the first set of verses that we're going to look at are words from Paul to a younger friend of his named Timothy. And Paul and Timothy were so close that Paul often called him my son. And listen to these words that Paul writes, again, to his brother, to his son, to his friend named Timothy. This is 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Here is what Paul writes. Paul says, I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. Timothy, I thank God for you. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your genuine faith. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Again, in 2019, don't do it alone. And just looking at these words from Paul, when it comes to the people who are closest to us, get this, we need to find ourselves a champion, not a critic. Again, when it comes to the people who are closest to us, the people that we let into the deepest parts of our lives, the people that we listen to on a regular basis, the people that we run to for advice, we need to find ourselves a champion, not a critic. A champion, not a critic. Just looking at these words from Paul, it is impossible to miss his deep love that he has for Timothy. He is a champion for Timothy. Find yourself a champion someone who loves you, someone who's in your corner, someone who sees the best for you and only wants good to come your way, someone who pushes you to step out even further in faith. I love what Paul says. Paul says, this is why I encourage you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you. Paul's like, Timothy, I love you. Fan your flames. God gave you a gift. Fan your flames. God wants to do something special to you. Fan fan your flames. Fan your flames. Don't listen to the haters. Don't listen to Satan. Instead, listen to the voice of God and continue to step out in faith. Again, we need to find ourselves a champion, not a critic. And sadly, the world is full of critics, isn't it? full of critics. Even Christians and followers of Jesus are often backseat drivers who are loud and quick to speak, but, but do very little for the kingdom of God. I pray today across our campuses, if we're here and we just know that our heart is, a, is the heart of a critic, I pray that God today would supernaturally change our heart. If we just know that our heart is a critical heart, I pray that God would change us today, that he would change us from the inside out. I pray that when we think a critical thought this week, this month, this year, when we begin to speak a critical word, honestly, I pray that God would convict us spiritually, but even move in our body physically, that all of a sudden we begin to push pause instead of play on our mouth, and we begin to think about the words that we're about to speak. Again, if we're a critic, I pray that God would change us supernaturally from the inside out. To be clear, critics make really, really bad friends. Really bad friends. And some of us today across campuses might need to change our friends. I'm not talking about the fact that we can't still love them, that we can't still be kind to them. I'm talking about those who are closest to us, like in our inner circle. Maybe we need to change our our friends. Maybe we need to change our friend again in 2019. We want to change, we want to change our lives. Find a champion, not a, not a critic. Again, it's not just about having people in our lives. It's about having the right people. So that's the first thing we need to look for when it comes to those who are closest to us. 
And then secondly, another story about Paul. Paul has, has a friend of his named Peter, and we talked about Peter last week. Well, at one point, Peter is worried about what others think about him. Anyone else ever struggle about what others think about you? You're not alone. Peter was in the same boat, right? And so Peter, he's worried about what others might think about him, and so he doesn't want to eat, and he doesn't want to associate with certain people because he worries that if he eats and associates with certain people, that, that people will criticize him. And yet we're told that one day, Paul came up to Peter, and he, listen in, he opposed him face to face because what he, Peter, did was, was, was very wrong. One more time in 2019, don't do it alone and just looking at the story, listen in when it comes to those who are closest to us. We need to find ourselves a challenger, not an enabler. Again, when it comes to those who are closest to us, the people that we let into the deep parts of our lives, the people that we listen to on a regular basis, we need to find a challenger, not an enabler. Again, Peter's worried about what others think about him, so he's not one to associate with his people. And in response, Paul opposes him because what he was doing very was very wrong. Now, just a few things to note here. It doesn't say that Paul texted him or sent him a long, crazy email because what he did was very wrong. I didn't see that in the Bible. If you find that, you just send me an email yourself to let me know about it. It doesn't say that he went on, pay, he didn't, that he went on Facebook and he passive-aggressively posted because what Peter did was very wrong. I didn't read that in there. It doesn't say that he went and he gossiped into, into the entire town and anyone who had just wanted to listen to gossip because what Peter did was very wrong. It doesn't say that. Instead, it says that he approached him face-to-face. Face-to-face. And also, Paul wasn't just some random stranger who kind of sort of knew him. Instead, they had a close relationship. And more than that, Paul genuinely loved Peter. Not just, I'm a Christian, and I kind of love you, and now I'm going to be a jerk to you. Not that kind of thing. Instead, I'm speaking face-to-face in relationship, and I love you so much, and that's the only reason that I'm going to say what I'm about to say. I love you so much. I actually didn't want to say this, but I love you so much. I spent a few days praying before I spoke. I love you so much that I, I felt like I had to say this. Why? Because I want the best to come your way. Not secretly for my own gain. Not because of that. Not because I want to tear you down. No, anybody, any, only because I want good to come. I want good to come your your way, face-to-face, in relationship, in love. Again, we need to find a challenger, someone who loves us enough to ask the hard questions. How are you doing? How's your marriage? Someone who loves us enough to speak into us. I think you should go talk to someone. I don't, th- I don't like the way that you talk to your wife. I- I've just kind of noticed sometimes that you're kind of edgy towards her. You don't respect her. I-, I-, I don't really know if this is a wise decision, man. I don't really know if this is best. I don't really know if this is who you are. And I love you enough just to say it. This is not okay. Amen. I love you enough to call you out. What you're doing is wrong, man. It's not okay. It's not pleasing to God. I know you've done it for a long time, but God wants to change you from the inside out. It's not okay. It's not okay. I'm not going to sign off it on anymore. I'm going to call you out face-to-face in relationship and love. One more time, we need to find a challenger, not an enabler. Enablers are quick to say it's not a big deal. You're fine. You deserve this. You got to listen to your heart. You got to do what you want. You're an adult. It won't hurt anybody. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes enablers, they just don't want you to make a positive change. Why? Because they want you to stay right with them. They want you to stay where they are. They don't like their life. They don't like where they're standing. They don't like their marriage. They don't like their family. They don't like their job. And they don't want to see you make a positive change, a change that they haven't made on their own. And enablers, they seem like they love you, but they're actually pushing you further away from God. They seem like they love you, but they're actually pushing you towards bad decisions, away from your spouse, away from your family, away from getting in the Bible, away from God's plan, away from God's truth, away from God's grace. To be clear, again, enablers make really, really bad friends. Doesn't mean we can't love them. Doesn't mean we can't be kind to them. I'm talking about those who are closest to us, our closest brothers and sisters, those who we call family, even though we're, we're, we're brothers from another mother, you know? Those people make terrible friends. Some of us might need to change our friends. If we're here today and we, we just know that we're an enabler, I pray we'd stop it. As followers of Jesus, we should only push people closer to Jesus, not further away from him. And Jesus, he holds some of his strongest words for those of us who are followers of him who push people further and further away from him. 
Again, we need to find ourselves a challenger, not an enabler. Okay, so in this new year, don't do it alone. And when it comes to the why, maybe you're wondering why. Like, why should we not do it alone? There's so many reasons that, 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 that we could give. First off, Jesus tells us not to do it alone. That should be enough in itself. Along with almost every person in the Bible says the exact same thing. Do not do it alone. But also, here's the simple truth. Why shouldn't we do it alone? Because together we're just better. Why shouldn't we do it alone? Because together we're just better. Like why would we? It just would be foolish to do it alone. Why? Because together we're just, we're just so much better. Now, <clears throat> even though I have chickens in my backyard and I have a, a small tractor in my garage, it's a 1948 Alice Chalmers G, in case you're wondering about my sweet tractor, even though those two things are true, it's going to be hard to believe it, I'm not a farmer, okay? <laughs> I might look like a farmer. Farmers have pink-colored shoes and they wear camouflage a lot. But I'm not a farmer, but today I'm going to share just some simple facts about horses, and you might want to check every single word I'm going to say about horses because I'm not a farmer. Um, but for hundreds of years, horses have been used for pulling things, right? Plows and wagons, you name it, they pull it. But get this, a draft horse on its own is able to pull 8,000 pounds alone. That's, that's pretty amazing. A draft horse on its own is able to pull 8,000 pounds, but what can two horses pull if you guess 16,000 pounds, you're wrong. What can two horses pull? 24,000 pounds. They can do eight alone. Together, they're able to do 24,000 pounds. But get this. If two horses are trained together, if two horses work side by side together for some time, they're able to pull 32,000 pounds. Literally four times, four times the amount that they're able to pull alone together, we're just, we're just so much better. We're just so much better. Now, when I look at my own life, this has been true of so many different people in my life. I think of friends. I think of my wife, family. I think of my parents, just brothers, sisters in Christ that have just been there, and we've just been so much better together doing things we'd never be able to do alone. But this week, one of the things that came to mind for me was eight years ago as a church, Eight years ago as a church, we were just a, a new church, few years old. The church was going like crazy, just growing and growing and growing, and everything was, was going fantastic. Everything was wonderful, except me. Except me. I was exhausted. Even the, the church was, even though it was doing so good and people were being reached for Christ, we had 500 or so people coming on a Sunday. I never thought we'd have more than 100 on a Sunday. Everything was going wonderfully, except I was struggling with depression. And I was totally and completely overwhelmed. And we had a handful of part-time staff that were awesome. The people in the church were fantastic. But oftentimes still, I, felt, I still felt completely alone. One day, I'll never forget it, I just hit the end of my rope. And I just knew that something had to give, something had to change because uh, I wasn't doing well and I needed help. I reached out to the leadership of the church and I just remember crying in front of them for a good 45 minutes and not saying a word, just crying. I just told them I was struggling and I wasn't doing anything wrong. I just was exhausted and I needed help. So we ended up hiring our, our first full-time staff person. You've maybe, maybe heard of the guy before. His name's Travis Waltner. Remember that guy? <laughs> that video I'm still having nightmares over, actually. <laughs> if you don't know, Travis is now our T campus pastor. When we first hired him, he was our executive pastor. And when we hired Travis, it was so clear that I was no longer alone. Instead, I had a champion. I had a champion, someone who told me to keep going. Someone who told me I was doing well. Someone who in the moment would pray for me. Someone who would give me a scripture just to encourage me with God's truth instead of the lies I was believing. 
just a champion, not a critic. Travis is also a challenger, not an enabler. Adam, I think we can do this a better way. Adam, I think there's a better way to word that. Adam, I'm not sure you handled that meeting very well. Adam, I think maybe we need to stop and pause for a second. Adam, I think, I think, I, Adam, I think, I actually, Adam, you need to take a week off. Adam, you actually shouldn't preach for a little bit. Adam, like, again, he was a challenger, not an enabler. And I was the same for him, and we were both in the trenches pulling together. And looking back, we were able to do so much more together. And for me personally, the church was no longer a burden, it was a blessing. And we just began to see God move in ways that we never dreamed of. And honestly, I, I just thank God for you, Travis. Thank you so much. One last time, together we're just better. Now as we close things up today, I just want to ask a simple question. This year in 2019, what do you hope to accomplish? What do you hope to accomplish? At the end of this year, what change do you want to make? Maybe it's your marriage. You're like, man, I want my marriage to be life-giving. Right now it feels dead. I want it to come back to life. Maybe it's in your walk with Jesus. You, you followed Jesus faithfully in the past, but at some point you just began to be hit or miss. And it's like, this year I want to read my Bible. This year I don't want to remain the same jacked up person. This year I don't want to be a jaded cynic anymore. This year, God, I want to accomplish. I want to get healthy. I want to make this. I want to be used by you. Again, what do you hope to accomplish this year? That's a great question. We ask that every single year. The second but most important question I want to ask, who are you doing it with? We ask the first question every year, resolutions, I'm going to change my life. Who are you doing it with? Who's fighting the battle with you? Who's in the trench beside you? Who's telling you to keep going? Who's a champion in your life? Who's a challenger? This is not okay. You're better than this. You're a better dad than this. You're a better husband than this. You're a better person. Who's with you? What we want to accomplish, we won't on our own. We need other people in our lives. So who's that person? If you don't have them, find them. Stop giving excuses this week, today, start finding them. If you got a champion, look for a challenger. If you got a challenger but no champion, you need both. It's easy in this day and age, everyone else is flaky and cop out, and I don't have friends because of them, because of them. This isn't on them, this is on us. This is on you, it's on you, it's on you. You don't have people in your life, it's on you, it's on you. Again, who are you doing it with? In 2019, I pray this one simple thing we put in our lives, starting with myself. Gosh, I'm preaching to me today. Don't do it alone. Find a champion, not a critic. Find a challenger, not an enabler. We're just so much better together. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Heavenly King, we love you so much. We love you so much. And even looking at you and the, the Trinity, it's just better together. You walking around, you're fully God, and you had 12 fellas around you. You're, we're just better together. God, we're just so much better together. I pray if we don't have someone in our lives who's a champion, we'd find it this week. If we don't have a challenger, we'd find it. We'd reach out, we'd, we'd grab coffee with someone, we'd send a text message to somebody, hey, what, we just want to connect on a regular basis. Hey, I know we hang out at work, but would you want to grab coffee before work or after work? We just find this, we need it. We need it. We're better together. Lord, we love you. We're so thankful that you meet us where we are. We pray all these things and all God's people said, amen, amen.